Hello, do you already use Power Query in Excel, Power BI or in other applications? If you do, you probably are amazed already by the power of this tool. And if you have had the opportunity to apply Power Query to solve different problems, you might have experienced situations where you wish the user interface ribbon would offer you even more options than it already does. That's a sign that you are ready to start paying attention to the M code that Power Query writes behind the scenes and dedicate yourself to understanding it to then take advantage of it. In this presentation, I will talk about how we can start learning the M language and I will share three examples of how our Power Query solutions can become so much more dynamic and powerful by adding little tweaks to the M code. As always, if you like this content, please give this video a thumbs up, leave your feedback in the comments, subscribe the channel and these tips with your network. The recording that follows was my presentation to the event Excel Weekend 7 back in June 2021. You can find my slides in my Telegram channel. The link is in the video description. Okay, so what's the agenda for today? What is the M language and how to access that code? We will see what that is, how we can learn, and uh, some examples. In Power Query, when we are using the user interface, we can build amazing solutions just by using what the user interface offers us. And we, when we do that, Behind the scenes, the code is being generated for us, and that's what allows us to come back later and refresh a query and get our data updated. These are all the applications uh, where we where, that use the M language. Today, we are going to use Excel. In here, I have several links, several links to pages where you can get some information. For our topic today, this is the most important page to mention. Power Query M Formula Language. This is where you can learn uh, what the M language is. And if you refer here to Power Query M Functions and then uh, M Functions Overview, these are all the M function categories that we can use. For example, with date functions, we can see that we have, we can get the add dates to a date, uh, add months to a certain date, and so forth. There's so many, so many different functions. I encourage you to take a look at what we have here and uh, just to have an idea of what is available. So being aware that this exists, then we can come back to here every time we need to solve a problem and we don't seem to find any specific button in our Power Query user interface that uh, seems to be the one that allows us to solve the situation in our hands. To learn, uh, one of the things I recommend is to have the formula bar activated. I will show you how to do that and uh, start paying attention to the code that is generated in that formula bar. And little by little, you will be able to identify the different components in one of each one of the M functions and be able to manipulate those components the way you need, okay? Another way is to go to the View and Advanced Editor, and in there, you will be able to see our code. We will go through that as well. So first example, uh, how can we access the value of just one cell in the Power Query editor? You know that when we are working by, with Power Query, by default, we are working with full tables and we refer to full columns. But sometimes we need just one certain value in just one specific cell. Let's see how to do that. So in this specific situation, I have a file with a query that is connecting to this folder. This folder has reports from different stores. I was not successful at getting the store managers to send me the file all with a consistent uh, name. And I cannot really re rely on the file name to get the information about my store. And when we open one of uh, the reports, all of them have the same structure. They just vary in the name, in the number of rows, and of course, the specific values there. But we see that we have a store code here in column three, row one. So I really wanted to get this information in a new column here at the end 
so that when I combine all the different stores data into just one table, I know which portion belongs to each store. Let's close this report. I already have a query here in this extra in this external file pointing to that folder that uh, um, brings me the combination of the data from the different stores. But as you see, we don't have a column indicating the store code for each one of the records. Okay, so if you go to data, queries and connections, we have the queries that I already mentioned and built before. This one is my main query, and these other ones are the helper queries that uh, Power Query generates for us when we uh, connect to a folder. Control Shift Plus to get this a little bit bigger. So here is the result of combining the information from different stores. You, we don't have the store ID or store code. If you go here to the transform sample file query, this is the, uh, the query where we explain Power Query what it needs to do with which one of the files. In this case, we are going to uh, the source. By default, it's the first file in the folder. And then uh, we're in this, we can see that we have these extra rows here at the top that we can remove to get to the table with the data we need. Then we promoted the first row as headers, and then we split it. We have an extra step here that consists in splitting the information in this column. Okay, now I want to refer to what I had in the source step and then extract the value in that cell. So to do that, I can come here to my last step, come to my formula bar. If you don't have it there, you can come to view and put a check mark there. Okay. And uh, Click here to generate a new step. Uh, it, the name of the step is automatically uh, created by Power Query, but you can change that name. Let's right click and rename this as store code. I want this step to give me the store code in this file. And remember, this is the transform sample file. So we are looking at uh, the, the data for one store only. Okay. And what is that I want this? Um, step to do. By default, when we create a step uh, in Power Query, it refers to the previous step. The previous step was named split column by the limiter, and because the step name has space characters, we need to put the step name in between double quotes and have a hash sign before that. Since I want to go back to the source step, and it, that's just one word, I don't need any of that, so no double quotes or hash sign. I just need to do type source. This brings me back the exact same thing I had there. So now to extract that value, I can say, OK, so first give me the column 3. And I refer to the column header exactly spelled the same way I have here, column 3, enter. This gives me a list where each element of the list is one value in that column. Now, from this column, I want the first element in the list. We need to remember that Power Query is zero based, meaning that row one will be index zero. So here, if I put a zero, press enter, I get the value of the first element in that list that I brought by, from table source, column three. If I had done the other way around, first indicating the row, I get the record, so the information about all the fields in that row. So these are the field names, which correspond to the column headers, and then the values in each one of those fields. And then I can say, from this record, uh, record 0, I want the value in column 3. So I can put the column name at the end. We will get to the same result, so both work. So now I have store code step generating exactly what I need to put in a column that gives me the store ID. So now I want to go back to this step. Because this step has this very long name, I can rename this and maybe call it base, just a short name to be easy to use. Let's go to the last step here. 
create a new step clicking here. By default, Power Query refers to the previous step, which was store code, but we can say, no, I don't want you to go there. I want you to go to the base step, enter. Okay, so I'm seeing the same that I had in there. And now in this table here, I want to add a custom column. So I can go to add columns, custom column, and in the custom column, I can say, I want to create a column that will be named store ID. And for in, in that column, I want you to type the store code, which is the step that we just created. Say, okay. And there we go. Store ID column, new column, with the store code populated throughout the column. We don't really need this step here. Here we have everything we need. So uh, we can come here and remove this step. Something will happen, an error, but we will take care of that. So now uh, Power Query always thinks I want to refer to the previous step. So it's putting this step here, referring to step store code, but and trying to add a column to that step. But that step store code is not a table, so it cannot add a column to it. So I'm going to replace here store code with base. Enter. OK, so there we go. Now we have the table we had before with this extra column we needed. If now we go back to the store reports main query, we see that at the end we have the new column store ID indicating the store code for all the stores. Okay, so to load the data, I uh, should before that come to um, indicate the data type. So control A to select all the, the columns. And then here um, detect that the data type and then make sure to go through uh, all the guesses that Power Query made for you and see if everything is okay. In this case, it's good enough. So I'm just going to do home, close and load. And I should see my new column showing in here. There we go. I can see I have three columns there, three store codes there. This was my first tip. I hope it was useful. Let's see the next one. In this second example, we will look at the specific request that consists in extracting all the data from one certain data set where we are interested in getting the records belonging to dates starting in the current month's uh, first day and all the dates after that. So current month and all the future, any future dates that may exist in our data set. So this is our data. And we can see it starts in January 1st and goes down to July 9th. So data from table range. My table has headers. We have only two columns because it's just for the purpose of this demo. Uh, it's enough. Control Shift Plus to zoom in. We see that we already have change type applied here. Uh, but it didn't guess it right. Here we need this to be date. So replace current step, yes. So we have a date column and an amount column as a whole number. So since we have dates here, if we come to the filter button here at the top, we have this option date filters. And the array of possibilities we have here is amazing. We are interested in getting data after a certain date. But we want that date to be dynamic and refer to the current month date. If we go to the month options, we see that we have several options here too. Is in the next month, is this month, is in the last month. So we could try this month, but this won't work because this will give us dates starting in June 1st, which is correct, but then it will end in June 30th. And the function, M function we get here is a specific function for this particular request of getting the dates from the current month is in current month. So this won't work for what we need. So let's delete that. 
And let's see how we can do this. There's probably different ways of going about it. My uh, strategy many times is to first make this work for a specific value, and then let's see how we can make that value dynamic to answer correctly to our request. So if we go to date filters, we can go and use after. In the after, is after or equal to, and I, in this specific case, I want is after or equal to June 1st, which is the month I am recording this video. So, okay, so I'm recording the video in June uh, the 5th. And in this case, my function here is say, give me all the dates that are greater than or equal to the specific date. This is also a, a, an M function uh, that has three components, the year, the month, and the day. The day is always one for what we need. We want to start in day one of the current month. But then the month and the year need to be dynamic to be the month and the year of the time we update our query. So what we can do is start by referring to the current time. For that, we have the function now. This function does not have any parameters, OK? If I press enter, of course, I'll get an error here. And this is because my function is expecting a month value here. And this is a date time value. From this current date and time, in fact, I just need the date portion, not the time. So date time dot, and then we have date here, dot date. So date time dot date, open parenthesis, and then we put the date time local now function in it. It's the same thing as nesting. If you look up with an if function in Excel, a match inside an index, same thing. So here, we if we do enter, it still won't work because this value is a date. And in between these two commas, the date uh, dash hashtag date function is expecting a month value so now this is returning me a date and i can say okay from this date return me give me the month okay there we go so nesting these different functions allowed us to extract the month value for the current moment we are in, then we can come here and replace the year 2021 with the exact same thing, except that here instead of date.month, we will get date.year. Enter. And this will work. It's working, but it's dynamic. I won't be able to demonstrate that it's working because for that I would have to come back another month and run the query and see that this is dynamic okay here now we just need to do close and load and we will get our dates always starting from the first of the current month onwards until the end of the data we have available in this case it is july the 9th the important lesson here is be aware that we have many, many, many M functions available to us. Some of them are not available directly through the buttons and the options we have in the Power Query ribbon, but you can include them in your code. Now let's see the last example, dynamic column list. In this example, I have a table with information about several events. Every time a new event happens, uh, we get a new column name here, and this column can be named anything. And we always want to get the first column, which is always named location, and the last column in our table. How can we do that? One way of doing this could be the following. So let's work in the very same file, selecting the data, and go to data from table slash range. 
And in Power Query, let's use kind of the same approach as before. Let's work first, make this work first for one specific value and then make that find a way of turning that value into something that is dynamic to give us always what we need. So in this specific situation where my last event was the handwriting day, I want to extract from this column the first column, go to the end and select the last column, right click and remove other columns. Uh, I forgot to say that Power Query added the change type um, step in here. Let's remove it for now and then we add it after we have only the columns we need. So I get this function table.selectColumns and then in here I have the column names hard coded in my function. This means that the next time I run the code, the Power Query will be looking for a column uh, handwriting day, but that's not the column I want to select the next time. It's I want to select whatever next the last column will be in my date at that time. So let's keep that in mind. Uh, the last step I would do to to extract to complete this query will would be to come and uh, change the data type. So here I want this to be text and the last one, let's say whole number. And then I would go close and load two. And let's see, let's put it here in the existing worksheet just below this table, just for the purpose of this demonstration. Okay, so we get location and, and writing day, which are the two columns I am interested in. Let's go back to editing our query to make this dynamic. How do we teach Power Query that I'm not interested in the handwriting day specific column, I am interested in whatever is the our last column. So before these two last steps, I want to make, find a way of making Power Query find the name of the last column that is hard coded here. So what I really need is to find a way of replacing handwriting day by something that returns me the name of the last column dynamically, uh, the, regardless of what that column name is. Okay, so before these two steps, I need to find a way to do that. So let's go to source and create a new step here, insert. And I want to use the following function table dot column names. I have it here. Double click there and then open parentheses and refer to the source table in there. So this gives me the name of all the columns in my source table. OK, for from this list, I want to keep only the last one We For that, we can use this button here. Keep bottom items insert a step and in here I want to say one and it gives me the a list with just one element and now I want to extract that value so I want to say index zero to indicate the first item of the list which is in fact only one we could refer to the function that gives us the count of columns, but this is just easier. OK, so we can, in fact, um, make these steps, two steps, just one. So this one is referring to the custom step and the custom step is referring to the table source. So we can copy this and come here and replace these in there. Again, we are nesting functions, one inside the other. So now we don't need that step anymore. OK, so now we have the source. This step automatically was named navigation. And it does not give us the option to rename it. So let's, because it's a special step after the source. So let's leave it like that. But now we need to do something here. Here, the removed uh, other columns step is referring to 
um, the last step we had here in the navigation, which was to keep the last items. Let's delete that and say, I want to refer to the source step. Okay. Enter. Okay. So we have our source table. We have a navigation step that is giving us the name of the last column. And we have the other two steps we had before. Here we have the end writing day, but the value we have here, we want it to be dynamic and it's being generated by the step navigation. So we can try to type navigation here. It doesn't work because again, the navigation step is a special step that in fact, if we go to our code, if we go to view advanced editor, we see that we don't have a navigation step here, that the step is called kept last items. Okay. Uh, we can try rename this here as last column name. And then we can use last column name here and in here, the same last column name. Okay, so let's see if that works. So this worked. It keeps calling navigation to this second step, but in our code, we gave it a different name and we are using it in our function. There are other ways of uh, working with this. We could just eliminate this step. For example, we could just eliminate this step from here, copy this code and put it here twice. Same thing twice. And then we don't need this there. And in here, we need we are referring to the previous step source, so everything is okay. So that also works. Now we don't need the navigation. We don't have a navigation, so everything is good. Uh, let's see if this works. Let's bring a new date, a new column to our data. This would be the science fiction day. Refresh, and there we have our data, 231, 261. These are the values here in our column. So it's working. So the tip here was, remember you have many functions available. Remember that you can nest M functions ones inside of others. And remember that you can manipulate the code both in your formula bar and in your advanced editor, okay? So how excited are you now about giving the M language a try? If you like this content, your like, comment, and share is very much appreciated. Consider subscribing the channel and turn on the notifications so that you don't miss any of the new videos. If there's a topic that you would like me to address, please let me know. Bye now.